What's going on guys and girls, Static here, and welcome back to my playground, Black Aperture. Uh, I know it might not look like it on the surface, but I have made quite a bit of progress on the world since the last time you guys were here. First and foremost, I finally found a stable build of MC Edit. A lot of you were posting in the comments that there was actually a stable build of MC Edit out there, and that I didn't have to wait for one. The issue was that I was looking on the original forum topic for the uh, new stable build of MC Edit, not realising at the time that the creator of MC Edit had given up on the project. Apparently he wasn't uh, earning enough money from it and couldn't keep the project going. Um, and yeah, so when I figured that out, I went looking for the new uh, updated version and found it elsewhere. So uh, got MC Edit working and managed to expand the cobblestone cube, which is why you can see that the, uh, the glass uh, square that was around these glowstone blocks is gone because I no longer need that frame of reference. I'm um, not entirely sure now how large the cobblestone cube is, I haven't really been bothered to count, but suffice to say it's much larger than it was, uh, and that will basically mean that in our uh, slime spawning lab when we finally build it, and in our hostile mob spawning lab, we'll have 100% efficiency, so there will be nowhere else on this map for uh, mobs to spawn when we're in those spawning labs. Now the one issue with um, MC Edit or using MC Edit to uh, edit the top of this uh, facility, is that MC Edit currently does not support the upside down half slabs. And if you recall from the previous episode, that was something that I wanted to add to the world. I wanted to replace the uh, normal half slabs with upside down half slabs so that I could build directly on top of the uh, the ground without having to you know have that uh, half a block of uh, air be below all the builds. Um, so what that means is that I had to go and do something that I've been trying to hold off for hold off from doing for a while, and that's to install single player commands. So, yep, I currently have single player commands installed, but I don't really plan on using it for anything unless I absolutely have to, simply because I, I do like the hands-on feel of doing things in my world. So, for example, when we do spawn point, I do manually place all of the blocks on those pads, as I said, simply because I do like the hands-on feel of the game. Uh, even though I am in creative. I, I know it might be a little bit strange, but yeah, that's me for you. Um, so yeah, I uh, installed single player commands, and so we now have an upside down half slab uh, layer on top of the facility. There's a couple of divots around, and the reason for that is that um, I was recently experimenting with one of the new snapshots, not the most recent one, but the one where um, minecarts uh, and, and boats are now able to be dispensed from dispensers as the minecart or boat instead of as the uh, little item, um, which is basically what you can see here. I was uh, messing around with designs for a monorail, uh, and I should probably quickly put back that powered rail before I forget. Um, hmm. Bear with me for a moment here, guys. Just got to... There we go. Okay, and uh, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with um, basically what this is. This is, uh, you know, you'd have a bunch of minecarts in the dispenser, you'd dispense them onto the track, hit the, uh, the button, and that would power uh, the minecarts, push them forward, and because there was several minecarts in the one area, they sort of bump each other along, and you end up travelling along uh, just a surface without tracks. Uh, and so I came up with this little monorail design, very simple, but I, I like it, it's quite sleek, um, and my idea for it was to, uh, when we get uh, some walls around the facility, to have uh, a monorail track running around the facility as like a little bit of a, kind of like a guided tour. I mean, the uh, the monorail is quite slow. It's I think it's actually faster to walk, or same speed to walk, as it is to uh, ride around in the monorail. But it is quite a cool little mode of transport. So... Uh, yeah, I, I think I will get this working at some stage. The only issue with um, this design of the monorail is that uh, the carts will travel in a straight line, no problems, but once they hit a corner, which is what I was experimenting with here, uh, they become very unstable. Uh, when it goes around this corner, all of a sudden the, cart will want, uh, the carts will want to go diagonally, which is why I've put these iron blocks here. And so even, even with these blocks either side trying to stabilize the minecart, the moment the minecart clears the blocks, it starts going diagonally. So unfortunately, I'm not sure I'll be able to get the monorail to go around corners unless I do something uh, sort of like, whoops, sort of like this. 
Oops. Uh, these glass panes are a bit of a <laughs> bit of a pain to work with, but um, yeah. So something like that, I think, should keep the uh, so like that on either side of the track the whole way should keep the minecart. Um, or mine carts going straight, but I'm not really sure I like the look of that. That doesn't look quite as sleek as just the uh, the single monorail line. Um, so the other alternative, if I do plan to use uh, these monorails, is to simply have a station in all four corners of the uh, the world, and just to have the uh, the mine carts go straight along, and then you dock, get off, go the other way. So. Uh, if anyone has a, a different fix for stabli stabilizing these uh, minecarts when they go around the corner, please do let me know in the uh, the comments down below, and I'll see what I can do. Unfortunately, I can't give you a little demonstration of the monorail, simply because I'm currently not in the snapshot. Uh, you'll see I'm just in uh, Minecraft 1.2.5, uh, and I'll get to the reason for that in a moment. Now back to what I was saying uh, about MC Edit, as well as um, expanding the cobblestone Sorry, I keep saying cobblestone. As well as expand, expanding the uh, stone brick cube, um, I also added this little gap here, which goes all the way from the surface right down to... That's kind of weird. It's cool, you can see the sky through there. Oh uh, yeah, it goes all the way from the surface down to the void, and then has this iron block uh, wall. And the point of this is... Um, as I mentioned, I was trying to make this uh, the cobble, uh, stone brick cube 100% spawn friendly inside those pads, uh, meaning that the only place where mob, uh, mobs could spawn would be in our spawning labs. And so one way that I was making sure of this was you know, dig down into the, into the cube and use the old uh, transparent brick trick and you can see under the world, I don't know why, um, but there is a bunch of lava pockets and this uh, this water pocket down here. Um, it, it's really strange. Uh, when I first started this world, I used MC Edit to make the, uh, the stone brick cube and basically I selected from that corner down to the bottom end over there and turned it all to stone brick. And so that should have replaced you know, all these water pockets and lava pockets with the, uh, the stone brick. However, um, I've noticed that, yeah, there's those little pockets around the place. Not, not very often, but on the odd occasion. And it's really weird when you go into those little pockets, um, instead of having, like, you know, stone, dirt, all that kind of jazz in there, it actually is stone brick, but then there's a whole heap of air and water as well. Um, and I'm pretty sure the world was not like that until relatively recently, so I'm not sure if it's something to do with um, Minecraft updating the world to Anvil, but um, yeah, I'm going to need to fix that at some point. Um, so the point of this uh, iron block uh, wall with the gap is that when I was trying to locate all the caves and stuff underneath the surface to fill them in, I was also seeing caves out underneath the desert and over that way, and it was kind of hard to tell the difference between caves that I did need to go and take care of and caves that I didn't. And so I've put in this little border uh, so that, uh, for those of you who don't know how the uh, transparent brick trick works, is that when you place it down, you'll see all the way through uh, like solid layers until you get to a gap, and then you'll be able to see uh, the next gap. So. Uh, I needed to leave this gap between the iron block wall, otherwise I'd see straight through the iron blocks and into the caves again. So uh, that's what the go is there. So quite happy with that little addition. I know it's only a, a minor thing, but um, it's going to make thing, make life a lot easier for me. Now, other than that, um, I haven't really done a whole lot of work on the elevator. I've done a little bit, um, and I'll show you that in a moment. The reason I haven't really paid the elevator too much attention is because, to be honest, it's been giving me a bit of a headache. You know, things aren't working the way that they're supposed to. Um, for example, the uh, RS Norlat to raise, for some reason, sometimes when you push the button, it'll pulse the um, the indicator light, but the uh, the Norlat won't set. And that's regardless of how much extra delay I put on uh, the repeaters or how many like extra repeaters I put in. It Sometimes it just seems to not want to work. And... Uh, the weird thing is that even if, like, uh, say, for example, this slice of the RS Norlatch and this one are exa exactly the same, 
Sometimes this one will work and this one won't, even though, as I've said, they're, ex they're identical, basically. So I don't know what the go is. I think it might have something to do with... Uh, I've, I've heard some rumors that if you get too much redstone in the one area, it starts acting kind of funky. It's a little bit of a bug. Hopefully that gets fixed soon. Until then, I'm just going to have to keep messing with this thing and getting it into working order as best I can. But the one um, addition I have made to the elevator so far is I've, as you can see, I've got a, a bit of a torch tower going up here. And what this is, is uh, this is uh, allowing the RS and all that to raise to communicate between each other. At the moment, it's only for uh, going up. I don't have the, uh, the downward communication at the moment. So, for example, if we wanted to select uh, this floor from all the way down at the bottom, that would work now. Uh, but if we wanted to select the bottom from all the way up here, the RS and all that array down the bottom does not know yet that it's been selected. So uh, I'll be trying to add in the, uh, the downward communication um, between now and the next episode. But for now, I've left it at just the, uh, the upward communication because this thing alone, even though it looks extremely simple, it did take an absolute ton of tinkering. Um, and as you can see, I've gone for a completely different design up the top here. Uh, if you remember from the previous episode, I had a bunch of pistons up the top with uh, some lapis blocks. And um, basically when the, uh, the RS and all that got powered, the piston would retract and that would stop sending power along this way. And uh, I was going to use that to uh, trigger the, the torch towers. But that ended up becoming far too complicated. And because of all the... Uh, all the different pistons and stuff that were going every time you click this one button. Uh, there was quite a bit of lag going, so I wanted to try and minimize that and went for the old, you know, keep it simple, stupid method. And uh, so I've opted for these torches on the front of um, this block here, uh, which is good. This block was already here. Uh, this was to carry current from the, uh, the RS Norlatch up to the display. And so I've just taken some current off the back here and... Um, yeah, it's quite a quite a nice little solution, as you see, because I can take power on the block down here and a block up here. Um, there's no cross torque between the wires. I don't need to, you know, put uh, red, uh, some sort of solid block over the top to cut off any cross torque, which is very nice. It means that the wiring is a lot easier to see, which will make fixes in the future a lot more simple. And so the basic way that this uh, torch tower works, um, I know it might look a little bit uh, complicated when we get into areas like this, but it's, uh, it's actually very simple. Um, actually, I want to really quickly reset this so we don't have anything selected so you can see what's going on. Uh, so basically, at every single um, RS Norlatch array, the signal from the selector comes into a torch here. And so the torch has to be uh, in the on state so that we'll be able to turn it off when we select a level and the line coming into the torch and from the bottom of the torch must also both be off and the reason for this and I should actually uh, really quickly just add a repeater there I've only just realized that um, the reason for this is that uh, because the uh, torch here is on and it's not receiving power from below or in the side we can alter the state of this torch either from this level or from below uh, and so that's very important. I know it sounds like a little bit of a uh, like a no-brainer, but uh, trust me, when working with this much redstone, it was um, quite a pain to arrive at this conclusion. But that being said, uh, the elevator does, for the most part, work in the um, the up direction. Why is that not? Ah, oh, that's why that's not resetting. Uh, there are a couple of kinks I need to work out in a moment, though, um, which I'll explain. Uh, soon, but I'll give you a quick demonstration of where the elevator's at at the moment. Um, so, for example, if we're on the bottom floor here, uh, we can select our level. So, um, actually, I need to reset this as well. Uh, this is one of those issues that I'm going to tell you about in a moment. Uh, in the finished design, obviously, I'm not going to have to come back here and reset the uh, the Norlatch arrays, but I'll just quickly double check, make sure those are all um, off. Which, yeah, this is a little bit of a pain, I know, but this is uh, something that I'll hopefully be uh, rectifying between now and the next episode. Okay, so now that all those null latches are off, we should have no problems. So, uh, what happens is you'd come down here and you'd select your floor. So at the moment, we're on level 1. Say we want to go up to level 2, so you select your floor, 
And uh, at the moment, I've just got a jerry-rigged uh, elevator call button. In the finished design, um, as on level 4, I believe it is, the call button will be directly across from the level select. So you'll hit your level, hit the uh, call button, which we'll do over here. And so that very simply calls the elevator. So we've got our elevator here, and you just go in. And you see it takes us up to level 2. Um, so exit the elevator and it goes on its merry way. So now we're on level 2 and uh, just for example purposes we'll travel to level 4 although I'm pretty sure I need to replace the doors on level 3. Yeah, because I was uh, testing things out and I need to have the doors closed just so that I go past the levels. So I'll um, just close that up for now. So we've selected level 4 which is our ground floor uh, and again, come over to this jerry-rigged elevator call button. Again, that will be on the uh, other side. And so there we go, our elevator gets called to this level. And all we need to do is go in. Pass level 3. And stops on level 4. So, as you can see, it works pretty well at the moment. Um, so vertical level select does work. Uh, the issue though, um, which I've just noticed since, um, like ju just before filming this episode, is that unfortunately when we uh, select, or when, when we go into the elevator, uh, what the signal should do is reset the RS Norlatch. But the problem is that, um, uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but... Uh, so this, this line here is from the pressure plates that trigger the elevator to go up when we go into, into the elevator. Um, and so... Okay, so let me try and explain this. It's very complicated. I know I haven't given you, a, you guys a, a really good rundown on how the elevator works. I might do that in a future episode if people are interested. Um, but basically what happens is when we select a floor... On, like say if we select level 6, you'll see that um, any any floor that we select powers the reset line of the RS Norlatch. And basically what that does is, um, oh this is what I was showing you before, that uh, the level selector sometimes blinks on and then turns off. Um, yeah, unfortunately it's a little bit of a pain, but I'll try and get that working. But as I was saying, um, when you select a level, the reason that this torch turns off is because no matter which level you select, it powers the reset line of the Norlatch. And so I decided that um, because the elevator needs to know what level we're on, um, I'd take the current out of the uh, the reset line and use that to power this RS Norlatch here. Whoops. And this RS Norlatch um, is basically telling the elevator that this is the level that, we want, uh, that, that we're currently on. So when we hit that reset line, the elevator knows that we're on this level. Then when we take the elevator, we don't want the elevator to still think we're on this level. So those pressure plates there, the way they work is they send uh, current down here, which triggers the other side of this RS Norlatch, which tells the elevator that we no longer want to be on this floor. So it returns the level breakers and the elevator continues on its merry way. Now the problem here is that the, uh, the redstone line that resets this Norlatch doesn't currently reset our selection array. So what I'm going to have to do is make it so that the current from these pressure plates first uh, powers the reset line, which will reset all of the, uh, the selections on the, uh, the RS Norlatch array, and then powers the bottom half of this latch. So hopefully that makes sense. I know... Uh, it's a little bit confusing at the moment. You can't, the problem with this elevator is you kind of need to know how it works to understand how it works, uh, which is probably why I won't end up doing a tutorial on this elevator, but hopefully that makes sense. That's an issue that I hope to have fixed by the next uh, episode. And then that way, um, I don't know if I've told you guys the issue with that. Uh, so at the moment, um, the elevator is basically saying that uh, level, I think it's level 4, is selected. So if we select level 2 here, and oops, I'll just select that, and hit the call button. Um, now I'm hoping this will show you, show you the issue, but I could be, could be wrong. Actually, we'll do it the other way. We'll select level 4, 
and call button. Yeah, you see, uh, we selected level four, but because level two wasn't because level two wasn't deselected from before, instead of going to level four, we go to level two, unless we go through and manually reset all those RS null latches. So obviously, that's quite a big issue with the elevator. And so yeah, hopefully I'll have that finished by next episode. Now, in case you're wondering what this little circuit here is, uh, basically I wanted a way of uh, when the uh, the torch tower here gets updated. So say we were selecting this level here, uh, we don't want the uh, what what happens is when we select this level, it powers the reset line over here, but we don't want that to be constantly powered. Um, for reasons I won't get into. So what I've done is I've come up with this little uh, pulse generator circuit, I guess you'd call it. So you hit the lever, nothing happens, but when this torch gets power, you see that torch blinks for a moment. So basically what that means is that whenever this torch gets powered, this it sends a blink up the uh, torch tower here and powers the reset line for a brief moment. Um, so yeah, a little bit confusing again. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, yeah. Now, the other functions that I need to add into the elevator at the moment, which currently aren't there, are, as I've mentioned, the uh, downward communication between the null arch arrays. I uh, also need to get the doors working so that uh, when you travel, uh, w when you call the elevator to your floor, the doors will open and the chimes will sound. Uh, and then when you go to the next level, the doors should open and the chime should sound once you get there. So that's basically all I really need to do with this elevator before it's finished, is the downward function, the doors, and the chimes. And the chimes are basically uh, hooked into the doors as well, although I've noticed that the way that I'm powering the doors at the moment unfortunately won't work. Um, and if you're wondering why, uh, to, to close the doors, I'd need to power this block here to turn off this torch and turn off the power to this block, but that will be delivering power to this block here, which will keep this piston extended. So I'm going to need to rework how I've done that, but that's only a uh, only a minor issue. I can uh, I can manage with that. And you might have heard when we were going up in the elevator some of the uh, or one of the notes playing, and the reason for that is you'll see that this uh, note block here is currently flush with that block there, and what happens is when we go up the elevator, this uh, Redstone line sends power into the, the repeater, which powers the block, which actually powers the uh, the note block. So I'm going to need to move this block, uh, this note block, back to there, for example. So yeah, only uh, only minor things to do left on the elevator. Hopefully, it won't be as much of a headache as the rest of the eleva elevator's been. But once we've finished that, I'll be able to then. Uh, start building the rest of the facility. The reason the facility hasn't been, uh, or hasn't had that much work done to it recently is because this elevator is actually going to be the core of the facility. I'll be building the rest of the, uh, the stuff around it. So I kind of need to know how much uh, space I need around or behind the elevator. And I still want to put in a, a couple of walkways so that um, when the elevator's finished, it's not just you know hidden inside the building. We'll be able to come in here and uh, have a look at all the uh, the redstone because it is quite um, impressive, I think. Um, so yeah, once I've once I've figured out how much space I need for the elevator, we'll then encase it and start building a lot of the uh, the other facility, uh, the the other parts of the facility. So once this elevator is finished, you should see some rapid growth in uh, Black Aperture. So uh, other than the elevator, uh, between <laughs> between headaches, I've been working on a couple of little projects over here. The first one was the uh, the I don't know what you'd call this the iron iron bar down wire I guess uh, a lot of you suggested the a fix for the uh, the down wire um, previously I had an iron iron block here and what happens if uh, we push this button is that it powers that redstone line twice which is not what we want we want it to power once and uh, you guys correctly suggested whoops no, that's not glass. Um, you guys correctly suggested that if I put a, uh, a glass block there, that will fix the issue. So now if we push the button, it only pulses once. You'll see that the the repeater pulses twice. I'm not sure why. Um, I mean, the uh, the redstone line doesn't pulse twice, but the repeater does. I think it might have something to do with like a zero tick issue with the uh, the piston. But that's okay. That uh, you know the uh, the outputs. Actually, we'll test that really quickly. I'm pretty sure 
any outputs should only pulse once. So let's just place that piston there. Mm, ah, what am I doing? That's not going to power. That should power though. So we power this. Oops. No, that's actually not working. We get a uh, that zero tick pulse. Um, so I'll have to mess around with that and figure out what the issue is. Um, I'm pretty sure if we just hook this into most other uh, most other outputs, so like redstone lamps and doors and RS and all latches and stuff, the zero tick issue shouldn't be a problem. But if we want it to power pistons, that will be an issue. So I would like to get that sorted out. Now, although the uh, the glass block is a fix for the problem, it's not actually what the problem was with this circuit. I was uh, having a little bit of a look at the circuit and I realized that this little uh, module down the bottom, I guess you'd call it, is actually a clock. And so the reason it was pulsing twice is because the iron block gave the, um, the clock enough time to pulse through twice. Um, so the only way I could really fix this would be to, instead of using a clock down here, figure out some way of uh, powering it that isn't a clock, basically. Um, and also another little adaption, or adaptation that I came up with is uh, this circuit here. And this is essentially the same thing, uh, except in a one block wide and tileable design. So what I mean by tileable is that, as you see, you can place the two circuits directly next to each other and... Uh, these torches don't need to be here, um, directly next to each other, and there's no cross torque at, at, at all. So, for example, if we push this button up here, you'll see that line pulses, and you push whoops, push this button here, and that line pulses. So, uh, just a, a cool little circuit that I came up with. Uh, I was going to use this for the um, the downward communication of the uh, RS null latches, but... Um, a couple of issues with the circuit. The first being that I can't seem to find a, a spot down here to um, take the current out and use it to power um, another set of pistons, so to allow the current to keep moving down. Um, and also it's kind of, you know, not, not hugely bulky, but because this is the longest that we can have the, um, the fences, uh, we'd have that iron section, you know, repeated many times throughout the circuit and it would uh, end up end up looking too cluttered and uh, too bulky so I've decided not to use this for the elevator but yeah I might uh, might come up with some sort of a, a use for this design at some point. Uh, now the other uh, contraption that you guys submitted a lot of suggestions for was the teleporter here. Um, I got an absolute ton of suggestions on how to fix the issue with the the villagers getting stuck on uh, the center block over here. Um, the first suggestion was to use a range of other mobs. People suggested everything from you know, zombies to squids to you know, all kinds of stuff. The issue is that Regardless of what type of mob I use, they're still going to run into the same issue of not being able to, you know, uh, not not wanting to fall down to the next level and take any damage. A lot of people were assuming that I don't know, village was villagers were too smart and wouldn't drop off because they'd take damage, but something like zombies would because they're stupid, which you know makes some sort of intuitive sense. But unfortunately, the game doesn't work that way. So using zombies or other mod uh, mobs probably wouldn't work. Squids might work, as I'd be able to hopefully flush them down with water. But the problem is that squids, I believe, are... Why is that open? Uh, squids are, like, two... I'm, I'm pretty sure two blocks wide. Oh, I see what the problem is there. Yeah, squids are two blocks wide, meaning that uh, when we have the squids in one of the, uh, the chambers here, um, their head or their, uh, their tentacles would be poking out, and it would make the thing look... Uh, uh, kind of ugly, so I don't really want to use squids. Uh, the other suggestion that people came up with was to use doors. So if I jump into the uh, the machine here, people were suggesting uh, knocking out this block and putting a door here. And what that would do is that it would prompt the villagers to try and get to the door since they'd see it as a house, if I uh, placed a block there. Um, and when they went to try and get to the door, they'd fall down. 
Now there's a couple of issues with this solution. The first one being that I'm not 100% sure that uh, the, the villagers would go for the door at the cost of uh, perhaps taking fall damage. I think the, uh, the fall damage or the threat of the fall damage would override their desire to get to the door. Uh, also, as people pointed out, this solution would only optimize the system at night time because uh, during the day, although some villagers would want to go for the door, not all of them would. Um, so yeah, unfortunately that would not work. And the final issue is that doors look kind of ugly. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest, I don't want to have a, a wooden door just sticking on the side of the, uh, the elevator. That wouldn't look uh, very nice. Unless, of course, I edited the texture pack to make the doors look nice. Uh, but yeah, that might be a little bit too much effort for uh, for no reward, unfortunately. Another suggestion that people came up with was the uh, the tried and true sign method. So for those of you not aware what I'm talking about, uh, we'd basically get into the machine here and place a sign on this block. And what this used to do was that mobs would actually uh, view the sign as a solid block. So they'd be quite happy to walk onto this block here, but since the you can't stand on signs, they'd fall down. Unfortunately, guys, this has been patched in a, a recent version of Minecraft, and the sign trick no longer works. The reason I still have the signs on my uh, spawning pads in uh, our spawn point lab is just because I like the way it looks. I mean, I, I don't want to have just plain uh, stone brick slabs in, in there, or pads, I should say. Uh, the, the signs add a nice little bit of... Uh, white <laughs> to, the, to the design basically so that's the only reason I have the signs there so unfortunately the sign would not work in the design here. Another suggestion that people had was to use minecarts instead of mod uh, instead of mobs. Now minecarts would probably work because minecarts also have the uh, the force field so they would uh, teleport us and uh, also if I used minecarts I could then uh, put uh, some track on the block here, block here, and then curve it around. Um, the problem is that, uh, well, there's actually a couple of problems with this. The first is that minecarts, uh, as you'll see in the uh, the monorail design over here, minecarts do not stack, which means that I would only be able to store uh, nine minecarts per dispenser, which means I'd only be able to charge the system nine times before I needed to reload it. And that is not really what I want. With the uh, the villager eggs, I don't have any in there at the moment it seems, uh, but with the villager eggs, I don't need to re reload the system that often, which is nice. Uh, the minecarts, I would. The other issue being that the minecarts uh, being dispensed onto tracks only works if there's a track in front of them. So if I was to dispense the minecarts in the system as is, it'd just shoot a bunch of the item down onto that diamond block. So unfortunately, minecarts will not work. Now, the final suggestion that people had that was uh, probably the most promising was to use pistons to push the, uh, the villagers down. So for example, uh, we'd probably put a piston here and then a piston, uh, not there, probably down, uh, if we get an iron block, so probably down here, so that uh, when you power the system, the, uh, the villagers would fall here, then this piston would power, push them down to the next level, and then this piston here would power and push them off into the hole here. The problem with this uh, solution, as you know, much of a good solution as it seems, is that uh, say we've got this piston here to push the uh, the villagers in this direction. We also want to, if we're going in the uh, teleporting in this direction, we want to push the pis uh, the villagers over this way, which means we'd need a piston there. And as you can see, those two pistons kind of get in the way of each other. So unfortunately, that's not going to work. Um, so as it is, I'm kind of stumped for solutions. I've got a, a I've got a feeling that if I lower this block, uh, the the uh, the villagers should f hopefully fall down and then easily get pushed around this corner. I've got a feeling that the reason they're getting stuck is because uh, I need a diamond block now just uh, so I don't forget. Uh, is because when they land on this block and then move down to this block here, uh, the villagers on this block, sorry, the villagers on this block are hesitant to 
or that they're resisting trying to move into this uh, hole because they don't want to take fall damage. So they're staying on this block, and because their heads are at this level, um, they the villagers on this part here are bumping into them and can't fall down to this block. Um, so I'm thinking that by removing uh, that block there, all of the villagers will be on the same level, and so the villagers here will be pushing uh, against these villagers and bump them down. I'm not 100% sure if that'll work. I haven't tested it yet. I only actually just came up with that solution. But uh, I'll test it between now and the next episode and let you guys know what I find out. Beyond that, um, yeah, I'm going to need to do a lot of tinkering with this design to get it to work. However, that's not too much of an issue because anyone who uh, watches Doc M's World Tour would have heard recently that uh, apparently uh, Jeb and Co are planning on removing the force fields around mobs, which would render designs like this completely useless, unfortunately. So I've still got my fingers crossed that they don't go through with that. I mean, you know, there's really no harm in having the force fields on the mobs. It doesn't you know, give us any huge exploit to the game. Uh, I don't think it produces that much extra lag, if any at all. Um, although it would, I guess, produce a little bit because of the having to calculate the force fields. But yeah, the lag is not really noticeable. And uh, yeah, as I said, no huge exploit. We don't like get a bunch of diamonds because of the force fields. So I don't really see the, uh, the merit in removing the force fields. So again, fingers crossed, Jeb and Co. don't remove that. Um, if you'd like to see designs like these teleporters um, in future worlds like uh, Black Aperture here or in uh, Doc M's World Tour, by all means, guys, add Jeb and uh, all of the, the coders on Twitter and send them tweets letting them know that you're against having uh, that feature removed. If enough of us voice our opinion, hopefully they won't remove the, uh, the force fields. Just like with uh, Silk Touch on... Um, ice. A lot of us were requesting to have that added again, and now it's being added again. So, uh, never underestimate the like how much power you guys have to influence uh, Jeb and the other coders. Anyway, that's enough of my uh, my rant on the teleporters. Uh, onto this uh, new little creation here. Now, this is quite a nifty little contraption. I'm quite proud of this. This thing is a player proximity detector. A uh, little bit of a tongue twister to say, so I'm going to be calling this the proxy. Um, and so basically, as the name suggests, what the proxy does is it detects when a player gets within 16 blocks of the thing. So at the moment, you'll see because of these, uh, you'll see by these redstone lamps on the top that the uh, the system is off, which causes the uh, minecart to continuously just go around this loop. And um, unfortunately, it does power it on, but. Um, yeah, it's no real big deal, I guess. If you wanted to invert the power, you probably could. Um, but when we turn the uh, the system on, you'll see it closes that fence gate and activates the sensor. So the sensor will only activate when we're within 16 blocks of the thing. So if uh, we move past this iron block border, you see the thing turns off completely. We move inside and it detects us and starts sending a signal. So the signal is... Uh, is relatively stable. It's about as stable as I've uh, been able to get it. Um, occasionally it does turn off um, and that's just to do with the sensitivity of the design. The good thing about this design is that if you need this uh, redstone line to stay on constantly whenever you're within 16 blocks, you can actually increase the sensitivity of the proxy by uh, you open up the top here and put in more iron golems. The more iron golems you have in there, the more sensitive the design. At the moment, uh, if we check our entities, I don't know why it's saying nine, there's only uh, four. Yeah, there's, a, there's only four, um, four iron golems in there at the moment, plus the minecart, which I guess would count as an entity. Uh, and so with uh, only four iron golems, we do have quite a sensitive little detector. If I wanted to boost the sensitivity, I could add uh, or ha have like maybe six or eight iron golems in there. But you can actually do this with as little as two iron golems. The moment you put two iron golems in this two by two area, they start bumping into each other and they start producing these particles down at their feet, which triggers the particle detector and uh, sends a signal through the, uh, the bottom section, which is our... Uh, signal stabilizer basically. So it takes this pulsing signal and turns it into a solid signal out. And the good thing about this design as well is that um, if you want a solid signal you can then take your output 
from the bottom there or if you want a pulsing signal uh, you can take the signal from the top there so quite a cool little design I think uh, very compact um, yeah, if, if you've seen uh, player detectors similar to this, like for example in uh, Doc M77's World Tour where he showed his uh, wireless player detecting uh, waterfall door, most designs for this kind of circuit are quite large. So this one is uh, in a 4x4x, four by four by, uh, if we include the block that the redstone's on, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So 4x4x9 four by four by area. So very, very compact considering what it does. And especially considering that to boost the uh, sensitivity, all you need to do is add in more iron golems. I'm also pretty sure that you could increase the sensitivity by adding more layers to the stable, uh, the, the signal stabilizer. But at the moment, it's stable enough for my liking. So... Um, if you guys would like a tutorial on this uh, system, by all means, let me know in the comments section down below, and I'm more than happy to do one. Um, and yeah, I'm quite quite happy with this little design, and as you can see, I've added the uh, the black aperture logo on it just because it was looking a little bit a little bit plain, and I had this uh, extra area, so I thought, you know, why not? Uh, so that's that one done. Um, one other thing that I've been toying around with uh, since the last episode is I, I said to you guys that I wanted to try and get hold of um, fireballs that would shoot straight so we could have uh, a whole heap of wireless redstone signals around the facility using those fireballs. And I had an overwhelming response from you guys. I had at least 10 people send me uh, a, a message offering to make me a mod. Um, so thank you very much to everyone who uh, offered to help. Uh, however, the first person to actually send me a, uh, a working mod was a fellow by the name of Tormium Mods. So thank you very much for the mod, mate. Uh, very simple mod, actually, um, surprisingly. It, all you needed to do was drop in one class file into your Minecraft bin. Unfortunately, I was having a little bit of an issue with my bin in that whenever I dropped the class file in and tried to load up Minecraft, it gets stuck on that... Um, the updating screen stuck at about 90% and would not go anywhere. So if anyone has any idea why my Minecraft was doing that, please let me know. Uh, the final solution that we had for the um, the mod was he basically sent me um, his uh, his bin with nothing but that one mod, and so I just replaced my bin and it started working. So I'm not quite sure why that worked and just dropping the class file in didn't, but as you can see, we now have perfectly accurate fireballs, which means uh, if I set up a little bit of a demonstration here, uh, what do we want to do? We want some normal pistons and just line this up. Uh, we'll do it this way. So if I put a bud switch in here, Oh, of course, I can't place. That's the one issue with the uh, upside down half slabs is that I can't place redstone on them, but not really too much of an issue. Uh, I'm sure I'll be able to live with it. So, if we have a bud switch like this, for example, um, and then we put another dispenser, say, on the side like that, uh, we need some fire charges, which are right down the bottom, of course. And so we put those in there and then have the signal come all the way back. So you'll see if we uh, push this button, sends the signal over, updates the bud switch, which then sends the signal right back. So we can use this to send signals you know, around corners um, and then we can use it in conjunction with something like uh, the, uh, the vertical wire over there uh, to send the signal up and down. And use that to have some cool wireless redstone running through the, the facility. So thank you very much to Tormium Mods. I love the mod. It's only a, a, only a minor thing, so I'm quite happy to use that. Um, if anyone wants the mod, I'll... Uh, so long as Tormium Mods gives me uh, permission to add the, uh, the mod to the description, uh, there'll be a link for it in there. So you can just grab the, the bin and chuck that into your Minecraft folder. Um, if he gives me permission, I'll also just include the class file in case um, you guys don't run into the same issue that I had and you've got other mods installed that you don't want to overwrite. Now, the final little contraption that I was messing around with um, 
between headaches on the elevator were these little things here. And these are, actually this one's broken at the moment, I'll just uh, fix that up nice and quickly. Uh, these little things here are quite a little diabolical contraption. Um, I was watching uh, the Minecraft guys do ultra hardcore, and I got to thinking that you know if I got my hands on some redstone in a uh, challenge like that, I'd like to try and set up some traps, but I wanted to um, come up with a very, very uh, cost-effective, simple, quick trap to make that would be very hard to spot. And so this is what I came up with. I've got my uh, the Black Aperture Wall Mine Mark 1, since I plan on uh, coming up with some other designs, and the Black Aperture Land Mine Mark 1. And so basically what these are, these are just uh, taking advantage of the... Um, basically the most compact form of a bud switch you can make, and that's the uh, like powering a piston uh, diagonally, um, and then you can remove this block, and the mine is active. And so basically the, the idea behind the mines is that um, obviously you'd have the wall mine inside a wall um, and put some sort of a valuable block in front of the mine or I don't know, any other sort of uh, thing that updates the, uh, the piston. Um, when the piston updates, it realizes that it's not receiving any power, it retracts, the sand block will fall down, trigger the wooden pressure plate, which will trigger the, uh, what well, is currently a redstone lamp, but is just simulating TNT, since I uh, don't really want to blow up my facility testing, uh, testing these things. So, as you see, update it, triggers the thing very nice and quick. Um, and it's very cost effective actually. All you really need is one piece of redstone and one iron ingot for the uh, the piston and TNT. That's really all you need. Uh, on top of that, just you know, sand and a couple of pressure plates, uh, which are very easy to come by. And so basically the way you want to make this is you place your TNT, place the pressure plate next to it, place a normal piston on top of the TNT facing towards the pressure plate. Then you uh, would have a block uh, diagonal to the piston, and then if you've got a, uh, you can either use another pressure plate or you can use a lever, but you power this block here however you want to power it, you update the piston, and then you place your sand on top. So very simple, and then the moment you stop powering this block, that's it, this, uh, this mine is active and it's live, it'll go off any time a block updates, but if, you've, uh, if you realize you've made a mistake or you need to update a block around the piston, very simple to uh, make it safe again, you just send power to this block and you can um, you know, uh, update blocks around the piston very simply. So basically what I've got here uh, to test these is just a lever on the front, so if you see a red light on top of the block, it means that the piston is active and it will trigger, uh, and if you see no red, you're safe. Very simple. Now the uh, the landmine works with a very similar concept, but um, is slightly less cost effective. You on top of the uh, the requirements for the, the the wall mine, you also need one slime ball, and that's because you need a sticky piston for this piston here. And the idea behind the design is that the sticky piston, when it retracts, will pull the sand block up but it can't hold on to the sand block, so the sand block will be pulled up and then fall down onto the pressure plate. Now the reason it's not falling down onto the pr pressure plate at the moment is because you can just place sand on top of a pressure plate and it will uh, stay there, same as with like a torch or something of the like. Um, but when it gets pulled up and then falls down, it'll try and land on top of the pressure plate, which will then break the sand block. So if we uh, make this piston live, or make this mine live I should say, you'll see if we update it, very simple, does the same sort of thing. So these mines are, as I've mentioned, very easy to make, uh, very quick, very simple, and aside from the, uh, the landmine, which does require that one slime ball, is very cost effective. And now I've been testing the mines out in the desert over here, just to see what kind of damage they can do. Now the craters that we come up to first here, this is um, just with one TNT block. So with just five pieces of gunpowder, you can make this kind of a crater. Now obviously if the player is within this blast radius that will do some serious damage if not kill them. Uh, the issue is though um, 
they will hear the TNT get triggered. So the blast radius, they'll probably be able to run away before uh, taking the brunt of the damage. So you'll also want to try and include some way of uh, keeping them stuck in this area. So even if, even something as simple as putting up a single block behind them, that should they'll try and run away and then bump into the block, not realize what's going on, and by the time they realize what's going on, uh, they'll have blown up, basically. So just a nice, simple thing like that can be quite deadly. Then I started experimenting with higher TNT loads. This is about a, uh, I think about a half load. Um, so <laughs> as you can see, quite a sizable crater. Um, this thing over here was slightly more, and then over here, this is a, a full load on the system. So, um, and that includes this crater over here. So as you can see, if you use a full load in the, uh, the Black Aperture landmine, there's virtually zero chance of survival, especially if you combine it with the, uh, the block um, that sort of uh, distracts them. So I'll just show you really quickly how you'd uh, utilize something like the Black Aperture Mine. So basically what you want to do is oops, you dig yourself out a 3x3 three three area. And I believe from memory you go down 7 blocks. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Huh, interesting. Um, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, with that water's not going to allow me to test this unfortunately so we'll go and do it over here so as I said three by three down one two three four five six seven I can hear lava interesting so I'll just quickly clear out this area okay uh, that actually looks wrong I think it's uh, doesn't need to be quite as deep but that's okay um, so basically what we'll want is you'll want to block and then, so that, that'll basically be uh, what you're using to detect, or what the, the block that you're using to update. Then you'll want your sticky piston, you'll want a gap, and then your sand block, so this will be where the sand block is, and then the pressure plate, so yeah, it didn't need to be quite that deep. So I'll just fill that in. Okay, so once you've got that, you just place your pressure plate, and we're going to need sand and TNT. Uh, where is that TNT? There it is. Okay. So we'd replace that with a pressure plate and a sand block on top. And then that's the uh, basic version of the mine right there. So you'd also uh, put your pressure plate down um, and update the piston. However, uh, as I showed you before, the one, uh, one piece of TNT isn't going to create very much of a blast radius. So we'll, uh, we'll add a little bit of a charge. Ah, we'll go up one more layer. Why not? Make a little bit of a show of it. Okay, so just like that. Now, all we've got to do now is uh, step on this pressure plate, update that piston step off the pressure plate and the mine is now live but of course we want to first uh, just fill in and hide our uh, mine very simple so we can step off and there we go so as you can see uh, pretty big bang for your buck and very easily concealable traps so hopefully you guys enjoyed that one i know i did had a lot of fun developing that and i'll probably be developing a whole heap of different versions so uh, it'll basically be down to personal preference i'm also thinking of um, coming up with a roof mounted design as well so you'll be able to uh, pack these mines in wherever you want um, so yeah uh, hopefully you enjoyed today's episode guys that's all we've got time for today if you did enjoy today's episode, please do share that like button some love. I know it enjoys it, and I do as well. Uh, if there's anything in the world that you'd like to see a tutorial on, again, let me know. Aside from the elevator, I don't think I'll be doing a tutorial on that. Um, and if there's any uh, sort of science-y kind of contraptions that you'd like to see in Black Aperture in the future, by all means, let me know, uh, no matter how wacky they are. And uh, if I like the sound of it, we'll uh, add that into the world. 
So, as I said, guys, hope you enjoyed today's episode. I've been Static, and I will see you next time. What's going on, guys and girls? Static here, and welcome back to my playground, Black Aperture. Uh, I know it might not look like it on the surface, but I have made quite a bit of progress on the world since the last time you guys were here. First and foremost, I finally found a stable build of MC Edit. A lot of you were posting in the comments that there was actually a stable build of MC Edit out there and that I didn't have to wait for one. The issue was that I was looking on the original forum topic for the uh, new stable build of MC Edit, not realizing at the time that the creator of MC Edit had given up on the project. Apparently, he wasn't uh, earning enough money from it and couldn't keep the project going. Um, and yeah, so when I figured that out, I went looking for the new uh, updated version and found it elsewhere. So uh, got MC Edit working and managed to expand the cobblestone cube, which is why you can see that the, uh, the glass uh, square that was around these glowstone blocks is gone because I no longer need that frame of reference. I'm um, not entirely sure now how large the cobblestone cube is, I haven't really been bothered to count, but suffice to say it's much larger than it was, uh, and that will basically mean that in our uh, slime spawning lab when we finally build it, and in our hostile mob spawning lab, we'll have 100% efficiency, so there will be nowhere else on this map for uh, mobs to spawn when we're in those spawning labs. Now the one issue with um, a corner, which is what I was experimenting with here, uh, they become very unstable. Uh, when it goes around this corner, all of a sudden the, cart will want, uh, the carts will want to go diagonally, which is why I've put these iron blocks here. And so even, even with these blocks either side trying to stabilize the minecart, the moment the minecart clears the blocks, it starts going diagonally. So unfortunately, I'm not sure I'll be able to get the monorail to go around corners unless I do something uh, sort of like... Oops. Sort of like this. Oops. Uh, these glass panes are a bit of a <laughs> bit of a pain to work with, but um, yeah. So something like that, I think, should keep the uh, so like that on either side of the track the whole way should keep the minecart um, or minecarts going straight. But I'm not really sure. I like the look of that. That doesn't look quite as sleek as just the. Uh, the single monorail line. Um, so the other alternative, if I do plan to use uh, these monorails, is to simply have a station in all four corners of the uh, the world, and just to have the uh, the minecarts go straight along, and then you dock, get off, go the other way. So, uh, if anyone has a, a different fix for stabil stabilizing these uh, minecarts when they go around the corner, please do let me know in the uh, the comments down below and I'll see what I can do. Unfortunately, I can't give you a little demonstration of the monorail simply because MC Edit or using MC Edit to uh, edit the top of this uh, facility is that MC Edit currently does not support the upside down half slabs. And if you recall from the previous episode, that was something that I wanted to add to the world. I wanted to replace the uh, normal half slabs with upside down half slabs so that I could build directly on top of the uh, the ground without having to you know have that uh, half a block of uh, air be below all the builds. Um, so what that means is that I had to go and do something that I've been trying to hold off for, hold off from doing for a while, and that's to install single player commands. So yep, I currently have single player commands installed, but I don't really plan on using it for anything unless I absolutely have to, simply because I, I do like the hands-on feel of doing things in my world. So for example, when we do spawn point, I do manually place all of the blocks on those pads, as I said, simply because I do like the hands-on feel of the game, uh, even though I am in creative. I, I know it might be a little bit strange, but yeah, that's me for you. Um, so yeah, I uh, installed single player commands, and so we now have an upside down half slab uh, layer on top of the facility. There's a couple of divots around, and the reason for that is that... Um, I was recently experimenting with one of the new snapshots, not the most recent one, but the one where um, minecarts uh, and, and boats are now able to be dispensed. Because I'm currently not in the snapshot. Uh, you'll see I'm just in uh, Minecraft 1.2.5, uh, and I'll get to the reason for that in a moment. Now back to what I was saying uh, about MC Edit, As well as um, expanding the cobblestone 
sorry, I keep saying cobblestone, as well as expand, expanding the uh, stone brick cube, um, I also added this little gap here, which goes all the way from the surface right down to... That's kind of weird. It's cool, you can see the sky through there. Oh uh, yeah, it goes all the way from the surface down to the void, and then has this iron block uh, wall. And the point of this is... Um, as I mentioned, I was trying to make this uh, the cobble, uh, stone brick cube 100% spawn friendly inside those pads, uh, meaning that the only place where mob, uh, mobs could spawn would be in our spawning labs. And so one way that I was making sure of this was you know, dig down into the, into the cube and use the old uh, transparent brick trick and you can see under the world, I don't know why, um, but there is a bunch of lava pockets and this uh, this water pocket down here. Um, it, it's really strange. Uh, when I first started this world, I used MC Edit to make the, uh, the stone brick cube and basically I selected from that corner down to the bottom end over there and turned it all to stone brick. And so that should have replaced you know, all these water pockets and from dispensers as the minecart or boat instead of as the uh, little item, um, which is basically what you can see here. I was uh, messing around with designs for a monorail, uh, and I should probably quickly put back that powered rail before I forget. Um, hmm. Bear with me for a moment here, guys. Just got to... There we go. Okay, and uh, so I'm sure you guys are familiar with um, basically what this is. This is, uh, you know, you'd have a bunch of minecarts in the dispenser, you'd dispense them onto the track, hit the, uh, the button, and that would power uh, the minecarts, push them forward, and because there was several minecarts in the one area, they sort of bump each other along, and you end up traveling along uh, just a surface without tracks. Uh, and so I came up with this little monorail design, very simple, but I, I like it, it's quite sleek, um, and my idea for it was to, uh, when we get uh, some walls around the facility, to have uh, a monorail track running around the facility as like a little bit of a, kind of like a guided tour. I mean, the uh, the monorail is quite slow. It's I think it's actually faster to walk, or same speed to walk, as it is to uh, ride around in the monorail. But it is quite a cool little mode of transport. So, uh, yeah, I, I think I will get this working at some stage. The only issue with um, this design of the monorail is that uh, the carts will travel in a straight line, no problems. But once they hit